Well, I guess it's about time that we started. Uh, I never know what when I'm doing a beginning beekeeper or first year management presentation. I never really know what the people are expecting to hear. Um, I don't know if if you want a timetable for when I plan on doing different things or when I would say it's a good time of year to do different management activities in a hive or to a hive. Or the other option is uh, first year beekeeping, the experiences that you probably don't think that you don't have any thought about. You, when it happens, you say to yourself, well, I never thought that would happen. But it probably will. Now, the the smart aleck uh, rendition of this presentation is that the first year beekeeping, if you have three hives, one of them will die, one of them will almost die, and one of them may make a little honey. And that, that's the, uh, in a nutshell, that's first year management. Uh, understand that your bees will die. Sooner or later, your bees are going to die. It, it may be 10 years before you lose a hive, and I hope it is, but I bet it's not. <laughs> I bet it's a lot sooner than that. Don't despair, because everybody, the, any beekeeper that tells you that they never lose any bees, they're probably just snowballing you. You know, Everybody that has bees sooner or later loses a hive of bees. Sometimes they lose 10%, sometimes they lose 50 and sometimes they lose all of them. In 1995, it wasn't uncommon to hear beekeepers in Kentucky say that they'd lost nearly all the bees that they had. And it happens. Don't despair. There's people that raise bees that you can get more bees to put back in the hive. The major part of your investment in a hive of bees is in the wooden wire and the foundation and other stuff that you, the toys and trinkets that you think you've got to have to be a beekeeper. And when I think about all the toys and trinkets that we all have as beekeepers, and you know the vendor's area upstairs is a good example of it with all the neat stuff that's up there that I wish I had one or two of everything. I think of that uh, rock painting on the side of a cave somewhere overseas where there's a, a naked guy hanging from a limb cutting a, cutting a comb of bees off of a, off of a tree limb. And, you know, that, that's beekeeping, man. That's, that's harvesting honey. That guy was tough. <laughs> As for me, I'm going to put a bee suit on, light a smoker, and try not to get stung. Another given with first year management, you're going to get stung. And it's going to hurt. And you might have a little swelled up spot on your hand. But uh, you'll survive it. Unless you have an anaphylactic reaction to it, you will survive it. Be proud of every sting that you get as a beekeeper. Because if it wasn't for those stings, we'd, be, we'd all be out of business. Because if bees didn't sting people, everybody on earth would have a hive of bees. Maybe two or three. But uh, be proud of all those things because that's what keeps us in business because we're doing something that most people think we're crazy for doing. And whether we're crazy or not, that's beside the point. It, it, does, it does help that the first question that folks ask you as a beekeeper is, don't you ever get stung? And you say, of course I get stung. And they say, well, don't it hurt? That's the second question. Well, of course it hurts. The third question is, why do you do it? And I don't know. I don't really know why I do it. I usually tell people it's just the adrenaline rush. You know, I, I'm an adrenaline junkie, and, and in a hive of bees, I know nobody is, no salesman is going to be brave enough to come out there bothering me. I'm not going to be bugged by door-to-door -door guys. But... Don't necessarily expect a big crop of honey from your bees in, in the first year. If you started with a package, you're probably not going to get a big crop of honey, probably not going to get any surplus honey unless it's an exceptional year. The exception to that, 
starting with the package is if you have drawn comb to put the package on, you're ahead of the game a couple of weeks maybe. And you might get you might get a little crop of honey. If you start with a nucleus hive in the first year, you have a lot better chance of getting a crop of honey because a nucleus hive you've gained three weeks over a package immediately. Because the brood cycle of a honeybee is, is twenty one days for a worker bee. And in a nucleus colony you get capped brood. You you get live you get every life cycle of the bee. You will get uh, everything from eggs that the queen has just laid up to dead bees <laughs> and all in between. You'll get capped brood that's emerging each day. You'll get pupa of all ages, larva of all ages, and eggs. So you're 21 days ahead of the curve over a package if you start with a nuke. In West Kentucky, where I'm from, 21 days can make the difference between making a honey crop and not making a honey crop because our honey flows are short and fast. They, they, they happen quick, and then they're gone, and sometimes we don't have another one. Our honey flows are kind of sporadic also. But if you're starting with a single, you've got it whipped. You're probably going to get a honey crop this year. If you started with a 10-frame single or that you bought it from another beekeeper or you had this package last summer and you babied it through the winter and it survived, thank goodness, and you're starting with a single deep this next spring, you're probably, you can expect a honey crop out of that. If you don't get a honey crop, don't beat yourself up too much over it because uh, the first year that I had bees, I had a, a nice big double deep colony and I read a book that said your bees will get to know you a lot better and won't mind you being in the hive if you get in the hive at least every two days so I got in the hive at least every two days and the bees got to know me pretty good because they hated my guts <laughs> I got to know them real well too and I developed a lot of pet names for them that I won't I won't repeat here because Barry's taping this, but uh, uh, they didn't make nothing. They just barely made enough for themselves to survive the next year. The second year I had bees, I caught a swarm, and then I caught a swarm from the hive that I had. I caught a swarm from some other beekeeper. And the, when my hive swarmed, the hive that I got from the other beekeeper, the swarm, I put right beside my other one. I thought, all right, I've got two now that I can look at every other day. And it was really cool looking at them, and I learned a whole lot in the first couple of years. But the swarm from my hive happened to be across a creek from my little bee yard, and I couldn't get to it every other day. And, you know, after I went through the two, uh, what, what became um, serial killer hives, you know, <laughs> They were rough. After I would get through them, I would I would just forego that third hive and wouldn't fool with it. I'd I had put sufficient boxes and supers, brood boxes and supers on it, and pretty much just forgot about it. Well, at the end of the summer, I was uh, going to do the you know the Hollywood kind of thing and go out there and dip my hand down in the hive and get a nice pretty comb of honey out of it. Well, the two hives behind my house. They had nothing in them. They were, they were just barely getting by themselves. Maybe enough for the winter, I was hoping. But the hive that was across the creek that I hadn't even been to but about four times all year, it was packed with honey. And I kind of scratched my head and uh, went back and I filed that book way behind all the other books that I have to read. I said, forget this. Uh, evidently this guy, um, not that he didn't know what he was talking about. It's just that he wasn't fooling with these bees. Number one, he wouldn't have got in those first two hives every other day because they were rough. But uh, I came to the conclusion that if you let bees do their thing and just take advantage of their efforts, you're a lot better off than trying to make them do what you want them to do. Because bees... You can't lead them very well. 
Uh, you know, you can just kind of follow them, and you can't drive them anywhere. But uh, you can just kind of follow them and take advantage of, of their work. And that that has worked really well for me over the years. I've been keeping bees 18, 20 years, I guess 18, 18 years, I guess. And that's worked really well for me over the years, just uh, giving the bees every opportunity to do a good job for me and trying to keep them healthy. You know, that, that statement there, giving them every opportunity, that includes trying to keep the bees healthy, giving them plenty of room, giving them good equipment, and making sure that they get through the winter all right. And if you take care of those things and keep a good productive queen in the hive, if you take care of those things, you can take advantage of what the bees do for you. Every year won't be a banner year, but uh, those those are the those are the main tenets of that I use anyway to make sure that I stay in business. I've never been able to make bees do what I wanted to. I've tried to raise queens a few years ago, and and finally I said, bees know a lot more about this than I do. So I kind of uh, I kind of took the approach of uh, watching the bees and just doing like they like they do. And I found that I can raise queens really good when bees are in the mood to raise a queen. But in August or September, when the bees aren't really in in, in a good humor about raising queens, I, I just quit trying because the, just I just can't make them do what I want them to do. Feeding bees, you can feed to simulate a honey flow, but you can't feed to replace a honey flow. Uh, there's something about it, about the bees foraging out in a field and bringing back a natural nectar source that just can't be replaced purely by feeding. I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm, I can't get inside the mind of a honeybee to figure that out. Uh, my timetable for management of honeybees is in January. I check the bees the first warm spell of January. It, it doesn't matter whether it's the first week of January or whether it's the fourth week of January. Uh, whatever the season brings, that's, that's kind of what I go with. The first warm spell in January where we've got two or three days in a row that it's warm enough that the bees are flying, I get in the hives and see how many frames of bees I've got, and I put a pollen patty on them. I put it right on the brood. Right when, when you open a hive up, you should in January, warm spell in January, and if January don't have a warm spell, wait till February. The first warm spell after the first of the year. But when you open a hive up, you ought to see something that looks like a, like a cow pile, for lack of a better term. I, I'm a country guy. You know. <laughs> it looks like a cow pile laying on top of the frames. It's a little, a little cluster of bees. You're seeing the top of the brood sphere there. And it's a little cluster of bees. Well, take your pollen patty, make it the size of that cluster of bees. Flatten it out, make it the size of that cluster of bees. And put it right down, smoke them a little bit, get them to run off the top where you won't kill a bunch of them when you put it on there. And put it right down over that cluster of bees. Put your hive back together and, and go along. That's all you need to see. In January, what you need to see is a cluster of bees. You don't have to get it, get the queen out and pet her. You know, she don't need walking or nothing. So, leave them alone then. That, that pollen patty, We'll do them good, usually for two or three weeks. Well, I go back in February. I wait at least two weeks, and I go back. Uh, if if the warm spell, if I'm doing this at the beginning of the year, first week of January, I wait till the first week of February, and go back into the hive because a small cluster is not going to eat that big pollen patty up that quick. There's just not enough bees in there to do it, but. Uh, I go back about the first week of February or wait at least two weeks and 
check to see how much of the pollen paddy they've consumed. Make sure there's still bees in there. Just because they're there in January don't mean they'll be there in February, even if you feed them. But uh, make sure there's bees in there. And I'll, I'll get back to the reason for that when we get around to October and November. But if there's still bees in there, still a pretty good amount of pollen paddy, which there will be, uh, I make them about about like a a good hamburger, not not a McDonald's hamburger, but a good hamburger. I make them about that thick, three quarters of an inch thick or so. I don't care if it mashes up in the frames a little bit; they'll eat it. If they don't, I'll clean it out later. I want to make sure they got plenty of feed. But in February, when I go back, I put one to one syrup, sugar syrup, on them. And I'm not particular about fructose corn syrup or sucrose, which is cane sugar mixed with water. I'm not particular about that at this point. Um, if they're seriously needing feed, the fructose would be the better option because they can digest that just directly. But I put one-to-one -one syrup on, a thin syrup. And that, uh, that, along with the pollen patty, should get the queen kicked into gear and get her started laying if she's not laying already. I usually go back to the hive in about two weeks and I don't get into the hive really. And up until now, I've not even taken any frames out of the hive to see what's there. And you are disturbing the hive a lot by opening it up, but if you're not taking frames out, you know, I don't really consider it really getting into the hive because most of these, uh, even putting pollen patties on, I usually don't even wear a veil. The bees, there's just not enough of them in there to put up a fight, and I'm very gentle with the hives. And just uh, When you open a hive up, you don't want to be able to count the flips that the inner cover does before it hits the ground. You know, you, you want to be really easy getting into the hive, and, and I'm like that, especially when I'm not wearing a veil. But uh, I, I'm real easy with the hives, and, and I open the hive up, put the syrup in if they need it. If they don't, I go on. Make sure there's bees in there still. And every, about every two weeks, I do that. The more bees that are in there, the more often you're going to have to feed them. Once you start feeding them, you got to keep feeding them until there's a natural source out there. When maples start blooming at home, that's sometimes in late January. Uh, it's always in February there's a bunch of maples blooming. When maples start blooming, I don't necessarily quit feeding, but I quit worrying about it so much. It, I quit being obsessed with it. I just check to make sure that, that there are stores in the hive and there is something for the bees to eat. The first time I seriously get into a hive is usually in March, the first week of March. And I will get into the hive and I will look at the queen. I'll see if she's laying, see what kind of pattern she's laying. Look at drones. I look for drones the first week of March. A drone, when you, when you find drones that are mature and ready for mating a virgin queen, if the way to the way I judge that, Larry Connor, um, Larry Connor did this demonstration, and I've started using using his technique. If a drone's crawling on the face of a comb, if you put your finger on it, don't crush it, but just put your finger on it and take your finger off. If the drone just sits there, it's very young. If you put your finger on the drone and take it off, and the drone crawls off, then it's older but not not ready yet but if you put your finger on the drone and take your finger off and it flies off like it's mad then uh, the drones mature and when I start seeing mature drones in a hive then I begin queen raising and usually it's usually somewhere around the third to fourth week of March sometimes it's even later than that but don't get in too big a hurry or think, wait until the bees are ready to do what what you want them to do. 
and bees are usually not going to raise a queen when there's not any mature drones. So I start raising queens the third, fourth week of March or when I find mature drones in the hive. And my method of raising early queens is to use a double screen system. Now this, this is beyond first year management, but uh, uh, it's just what I do. You know, if you're not in, in inclined to raise queens or to use a double screen system, that's fine. The management uh, option at that point is to let the bees build and make sure there's plenty of room in the hive for them to build. Don't wait until the bees are packed in one one single deep or in two deeps or whatever you got them in. Don't wait until that hive is packed with bees to put another super on. When this super, uh, and this this may not go along with what other people do, but this is just what I do. This is the judgment that I use. When the top super is half full of bees, do something. You know, you either gotta either either make a split, uh, take the bees out, some of the bees out of it, and even up the population in other hives by using frames of brood, or in the if you've got one hive or two hives and you don't want to do any of that, put another super on. When that top super gets half full, put another super on. And it don't have to be half full of capped honey or capped brood. Just when half the frames in that super are covered with bees, when you open it up, it's time to give them more room. Don't ever let them think that they've reached the top of the skyscraper, you know. As long as they see open comb to the top of them, they'll keep working if there's anything to work and if your queen's productive. That's in March and April. Make sure you got enough honey super zone. Make sure your queen is laying really well. If your queen is not, by, by the second week of April, if your queen don't have a bunch of brood in those bottom boxes, do something about it. Get you another queen. Do, do something about it. If you don't do something about it, the bees might. <laughs> they might supersede her. Then you'll lose a week or so of, of production, a week or two of production. Another reason for making sure you keep enough honey supers on is to keep that hive from becoming pollen bound or honey bound. And a pollen bound or honey bound hive what that's referring to is if you take a frame of brood out of the brood box, whether it's second story, first story, whatever, if you take a frame of brood out and you see capped brood and recognize that capped brood and in the holes that are empty where the capped brood has emerged, if there's pollen or honey within that brood pattern, put in that brood pattern, uh, you've got a you've got a storage space problem. The bees are putting honey where the queen should be laying eggs, and that is uh, that's heading you down the wrong track there, because they will pretty fast they will cause that hive to become honey bound or pollen bound. They'll do it with pollen too, and when the hive gets honey bound or pollen bound, there's no place for the queen to lay eggs. The queen quits moving all around in the hive and just stays confined on a very small place in the hive where there is open comb for her to lay eggs. The rest of the bees, because you're going to have a lot of bees in there at that point, the rest of the bees think there's no queen and they swarm. They, they create a new queen and your hive will swarm. Some people really love to have swarms, but when you have a swarm... Most of the time, you've watched your honey crop fly off in the air <laughs> because you need a good number of bees in that hive to, to bring in a good amount of honey. Now, that's not a given. Sometimes I've had hives swarm, and, and what they left actually made surplus honey. But most of the time, if you want the maximum amount of honey from a hive, you don't want it to swarm. There's several methods to use to keep them from swarming. Uh, I use the double screen method and, and 
basically swarm for the bees. I'll let them raise their own queen in the second story, keep the old queen down below this double screen. And when the honey flow starts, I take the old queen out and do whatever I want to do with her, make a nuke, give her away to somebody that I don't like, like Randolph or somebody. And uh, I'd sell her to Randolph. I wouldn't give her to him. And Or I kill her and do something with her. Let the young queen head the hive. You've got the brood from the old queen and the young queen going into the honey flow. And you'll make a, a better crop of honey with that particular hive. Plus, you have a new queen. Plus, your hive didn't swarm. In a worst-case scenario, the upper hive don't make a new queen, but all the bees are still in that same hive, and they share a similar pheromone because it uh, drifts through the, it vaporizes through the double screen. They share a similar pheromone, and you can take the double screen out, and you've still got a working hive of bees there, a viable hive. And that's the worst case scenario, and they still didn't swarm. That's why I really like double screens. They are uh, a little bit more labor intensive, but anything worth doing, you know, there's bound to be some labor to it. And I'd rather spend a little bit of labor using a double screen two or three more trips to the hive as I had climbing a 24 foot extension ladder and getting a swarm out of a tree. Uh, and that's the only other option <laughs> to keep your swarm, keep all your bees in the hive. That's April. In May, leave them alone. <laughs> Put enough honey supers on in April that you hope you don't need any more. It don't hurt to look in the top honey super. If you look in the top honey super and you see some drawn comb, in that top honey super, or if you had drawn comb in it and the and the tips of the cells are white, or that they've started putting brand new wax on the tip of the cells, put another honey super on right then. That's a sign that they're, that they're moving up there and there's a honey flow on and they need some room. When you see white wax on the tip of, on the tip of drawn cells. If you're using just foundation, if you see that foundation being drawn in that top honey super, go ahead and put another one on. One thing that I like to say is that it doesn't matter how many honey supers you have, the bees ain't going to put honey in them if they're sitting in your garage. They've got to be on the hive. In the spring, there's spring and early summer, there's no concern over pests or parasites for me. And the reason for that is that a productive queen will outproduce any kind of parasites that are going to be in the hive with the exception of American fowl brood. If you've got fowl brood, go ahead and burn the hive and get it over with. Don't, uh, don't have any emotional attachment to a hive that has fowl brood because that's kind of like having an emotional attachment to a dog, a pet dog that has rabies because uh, that hive with fowl brood is going to die, more than likely. If you treat it with teramycin or something, Thailand or one of, the, one of the other treatments for fowl brood, you might mask the fowl brood and save that hive, but eventually that hive is going to die and it's going to have fowl brood spores in it, and any bee that visits that hive to rob it out is going to carry those fowl brood spores back to its hive which may be in a tree somewhere, and then when you put new bees out there after your bees died, this hive in the tree that robbed your fowl brood hive and died, it's going to die, and your hive is going to rob that one out of the tree. That's why fowl brood is so persistent, because you just can't control feral bees and what they do. So if you see any fowl brood, if it's just one frame, just burn the frame. If, if it's just a few spots on one frame, just burn the frame and, and be done with that. But if you've got a hive that has a uh, fully, if it's fully involved with fowl brood in the brood nest, burn it. It'll be a lot, uh, a lot less. I, I realize it's going to be uh, heart wrenching 
to burn that hive of bees because I've burned some before. But it's a lot less heart-wrenching to burn that one hive than it is to baby it along and end up burning 20 hives later. But that's the only thing that uh, that a good producing queen won't won't outrun, outproduce in a spring, early summer. You might see some varroa damage, deformed wing bees. They look chewed up, kind of. You might see some varroa damage if you use a sticky board. You might see a varroa count on a sticky board that indicates that you might want to treat. You can't treat during the honey flow, regardless of what you treat with, unless it's powdered sugar. Uh, you don't need to treat during the honey flow. Uh, my advice is not to treat at all until you take your honey off. And if you want to treat your bees for varroa then, treat them then, as soon as you take your honey off. Now, the other half of that is take your honey off as quick as you can. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as that honey flow slows down and stops or stops, and take your honey off and treat for varroa if you have signs of varroa damage. If you don't have signs of varroa damage or you're not seeing a mite count of 50 or 60 mites on an overnight drop on a sticky board, forget it. Don't, don't treat for them. That's my advice. I mean, if, if you see one varroa mite on drone brood, that's usually how I check for varroa. I, I check drone brood. I pull, when I take a hive out, I take a capping scratching tool and dig into some drone brood. It's better to get drone brood that has uh, dark eyes, purple eyes. It's better because they're older and the varroa has had more time to to uh, mature. They're easier to see. Very young varroa are almost clear and tough to see on drone pupa. But the older they get, the darker they get in color. So they're easier to see. And I look at 20, 25 drone brood in a hive, and if I see less than three or four varroa on 25 drone brood, I'm not too concerned about it. I don't get concerned about it until I see multiple varroa on one one particular pupa. And when I see four or five varroa on one pupa, or if I see 15 varroa, total count on 25 drone brood, I get pretty concerned about it. I still don't treat them, but I, still, I get pretty concerned about it. I usually mark that hive and uh, check and see if it survives. If it survives, I really like it. And, and uh, I will make a note of that and raise a queen from that hive, make sure I raise some queens from that hive the next year. But small hive beetles, won't be a problem in a hive that's healthy with a good laying queen up until late summer, early fall. Varroa, same thing. When you have to really start worrying about varroa is August. When your your queen is beginning to slow down laying a little bit and the varroa don't slow down. Our queens slow down due to light of day and the varroa don't care. It doesn't matter how light it is or how dark it is for how long. The varroa don't care. They keep going. That's when a hive will get overwhelmed with uh, with a pest of any sort, with tracheal mites, with varroa mites, or with small hive beetles. The, the pests that really bother a hive, that's when they will overwhelm the hive is in August, September. That. So that sets a hive up for a rough winter, <laughs> August and September, if, if you lose a lot of bees due to varroa predation or tracheal mite. Uh, you don't hear much about tracheal mite problems anymore, but uh, I'm sure there's, there's some bees out there that, that don't tolerate tracheal mites as well as some others. Our bees have began to develop a pest and host relationship with both varroa and tracheal mites, and I don't think they're they're succumbing to either one of the pests like they did in the past. I believe they're beginning to kind of turn the corner, so to speak, on it. It's not to say that you don't need to treat for them if you see them. So you're through May 
and you're into June, and it's about time to start thinking about taking honey off. Most of the honey that's produced in Kentucky, in West Kentucky anyway, is produced by the middle of June, middle to the end of June. There is a somewhat of a honey flow on white clover the remainder of the summer, but it's it's uh, sporadic depending on rainfall. So I usually take my honey off in Kentucky around the end of June, 1st of July, and extract it and bottle it. And when I take the honey off, I check for all sorts of pests. Usually, mostly at that time, small hive beetles. And if I see a lot of small hive beetles, I don't really, I don't really worry about it. I just, I keep, I keep a lot of notes. When I go to a bee yard, I write a lot of notes. If this hive has small hive beetles, I make sure I notate that on my clipboard. And if it has a bunch of small hive beetles, you know, I notate that. If I see varroa damage, if I see K-wing bees, uh, K-wing indicates either tracheal mites, nosema, or acute paralysis. And a K-wing bee looks like that one right there, that poor rendition on the bottom right-hand corner. When you, when you uh, open a hive up and look at a frame of bees, if you see bees crawling around with their wings disjointed like that, unhooked, that uh, that indicates that they could have tracheal mites. Uh, if they if they will not hook their wings back together and fly off, it's probably tracheal mites because they're suffocating; they can't breathe. They're gasping for breath. If they look like that but they will hook their wings together and fly off. Either they got tracheal mites, but it's not too bad, or they might have nosema, which is like uh, the human equivalent might be amoebic dysentery to nosema. Nosema is not usually fatal to honeybees. Uh, nosema serrana may be a different animal. It, might, it could be fatal to honeybees. But uh, the nosema that we usually have, that we usually deal with, is nosema apis. And it's usually not fatal. They usually get over the hive. Usually gets over that. But they'll if they have nosema, they will hook their wings together and they will fly off. If they have acute paralysis, they will look like that. They will also hook their wings together and fly off if you pester them a little bit. But they'll also look slick and black, or dark colored, and they'll look wet because acute paralysis causes their hair to fall out. And an Italian bee may look yellow, but it's really dark brown with yellow hair on it. And when that hair falls out off their abdomen and off their thorax, they, they look black or dark brown. And they look, they look wet. And in later, in later stages in paralysis, they'll shake really bad. Shake and quiver, maybe even fall over. But that, that's what I look for when I'm when I take honey off, I look for bees that, that don't look right, that to see whatever is wrong and, and make, a, make a quick judgment as to what the hive might have going on in it. But these, these things, uh, of course, I've been doing this a few years, and the first year you may spend 20 minutes in a hive looking at it, trying to, trying to judge what's going on. You don't have to look at every bee on every frame in a hive, just look at a couple of frames of brood. And if you don't see stuff like that, don't worry about it. Put put the stuff, put the frames back in there, and, and let the hive go on. If a hive really has problems, it's going to have problems on every frame. If, if it's in in trouble, so you know don't don't drive yourself crazy trying to look at every frame of every hive. Just look at two or three frames out of the brood nest, and and let it go at that. When I take honey off, if the hive is huge, really active, or really mean, I may just look at a few bees crawling around on top of the top frames, on top of the top bars of the frames. I may not even get into the brood nest because they're not in any mood for it, and I'm not either. <laughs> I don't go into a bee yard with the purpose of getting stung into oblivion, and 
the bees don't, uh, if they don't appreciate my efforts, then good enough for them. If they, if they look healthy, then I, I deem the hive healthy and let it go. That's through June, July. I just make sure there's something in the hive for the, for the bees to have. I, I don't ever take off too much honey off of any hive. Most hives that die in West Kentucky that I've seen die from starvation or they die from factors that can be traced back to not having ample food supply. So I, I don't ever take the maximum amount of honey that I can get off of a hive off of it. I usually leave quite a bit more honey on my hives than, than most beekeepers. As far as pound-wise, I don't know how many pounds I leave on a hive because I don't, I don't know how many pounds if, if this double deep hive, two deep hive bodies, I don't know how much the brood weighs compared to what honey is in there. I, I don't know. There's, I'll probably leave, I'm guessing I'll leave 75 pounds of honey between the top and bottom deep, and I usually leave a honey super on top of that, or maybe even another deep that has, that's partially full of honey. But I'll leave plenty of honey on the bees because bees can starve to death in midsummer if there's nothing for them to work and there's drought conditions and the queen don't slow down laying. If you have a carniola and a Russian queen, when, when there quits being anything to work, they're going to quit too. So you don't have to worry about them starving, but you've got to worry about how many bees you're going to have in that hive going into the winter. So July, I just make sure that the hive has ample food stores and that bees are flying in and out of the hive at a normal rate. I make sure that it don't look like there's anything wrong with, uh, don't look like there's anything wrong, going wrong inside the hive. If you go to a hive and see a bunch of dead bees at the, uh, you know, laying on the bottom board, but there's bees flying in and out, well, that's a little bit suspicious. Uh, I'm a cause and effect kind of guy. I see the effect. There's dead bees there. I want to know why. Could be from robbing, robber bees, or it could be that something's going on in that hive that uh, that I'm not sure about. If I see anything that looks abnormal, I'll get in the hive and look at it. And if you have a small number of hives, it don't hurt to get in the hive and look at it if you're concerned about it. In November, or in November, in, in July... It doesn't really, they're not going to be making a lot of honey. So you're not going to hurt your honey crop. Your honey crop is probably already in the in the extractor or in the bottle. It's not going to hurt your honey crop to get in the hive and, and bother the bees at that point because they're not probably not working anything anyway other than maybe a little bit of clover that's in your yard. So just make sure they got plenty to eat and there's nothing strange going on in the hive. In August, it's the same thing, but in late August, you're beginning to get into winter feeding, uh, the winter feeding time. And the reason that you want to feed, if a hive is light in, in August, in late August, if you tip the hive and it don't have much weight on it, that hive is going to be in serious trouble in, in uh, December and January. And the reason that you want to start feeding in August no later than September, if uh, you know middle of September is about as late as you want to start feeding for winter, is because the population of that hive is not large enough in October or November to be able to be efficient at taking that feed in and storing it. You want a bunch of bees there available. You want all the work hands you can get to get that feed in there and store it and get it ready for winter, get that hive ready for winter. And another reason that you need to start feeding in August is because if your queen is not laying on up into September, October, maybe even laying into November, uh, you're going to have old bees in the early spring. And this is where we get back to the brood clusters in February, February and March, where you're checking your brood clusters and just seeing if there's still bees alive in there. You might have a, a pretty good-sized brood cluster in February and go back in March 
and the brood cluster is still there, but they're all dead. And you wonder what in the world happened because they all look like they've starved. They all, all have their heads in the cells like they're starved, but there's honey all around them. And it hadn't really been that cold in March, just a few cold snaps. If you start looking at those bees, uh, if you examine them close, you'll find out that they're usually all old bees. And by old bees, I mean that uh, they were produced in August. Uh, they, they came out of the cell in August or maybe September instead of October and November. And old bees just don't winter as well as young bees do. You want that queen laying late into the fall so that you'll have young bees that are primed and ready to take care of larva and pupa in the spring. And young bees, if, if bees have never taken care of a brood, a, a patch of brood, if, if they've never, they produce brood food, with this gland right here, the hypopharyngeal gland. And young bees, that's what they use to make royal jelly and the brood food. The hypopharyngeal and these two glands, labial and mandibular, also come into play and, and make some contribution, but it's primarily that gland. Well, if they've never really used that gland and activated it to feed brood, that's a young bee. Once they've started using their hypopharyngeal gland and, and fed a lot of brood, then it's almost like uh, they're kind of running on empty in the spring. And they're, they're an older bee. So you want your queen laying late into the fall. So you start feeding. If that hive is light, you start feeding in August so that those bees can, can pack that hive with honey and make sure that they got plenty of food going into the fall. And you keep feeding just a little. You don't have to feed a lot. You don't have, it's not like you got to keep a five gallon bucket of syrup on them all the time. But, but feed just enough that the bees have something that they're working. That they can, that they can get out of the hive and go work. Or that they can access in the hive. And keep feeding up until, uh, I mean, if it's just a quart a week, just give them something up until it frost and cold weather kind of sets in. You want? I, I would like to have my queens laying the first of November, and I, after the first of November, I don't care if they lay anything until January or not. They they can have a couple of months vacation. That's okay. But if you have any Russian or Carniolan genetics in your bees which uh, you may have or may not, uh, if you're not feeding and there's no honey flow, they're not going to be laying. That's, that's just the way that they are. That's a racial characteristic there. The, the Russian race and the Carniolan race just uh, don't lay during a dearth of nectar. That's a survival mechanism that is, is common to those two races of bees. Italians lay all the time. <laughs> up until it gets dark, you know, the light of day changes enough that they quit. So you're at August, uh, September, October, watch for fall honey flows. If you're getting a fall honey flow, put some supers on, quit feeding them, put some supers on, and uh, catch that fall honey flow. The only way that you can recognize it is to know that the bees are flying toward the flowers and to look at the top of the comb and, and see if, when you're feeding syrup, they usually don't, uh, it's harder to fool them into thinking it's a honey flow when you're feeding syrup. You just can't substitute for nature. And you won't notice the white, white tips on cappings as much when you're feeding syrup as when there's a natural honey flow. Because a five gallon bucket of syrup just can't duplicate ten acres of aster flowers. It, you just can't match it. So, just keep an eye on the honey flow. If you're lucky enough to have one, try to catch it. Try to get it. Keep an eye on the weight of your hives. Keep an eye on pests. In August and September, that, that's when you want to really be aware of how many Baroa are in the hive. 
You want to really be aware of small hive beetle presence in the hive August and September. And you want to really be aware of food stores. Those are the three things that probably are at the forefront of first year management or any year management. And that's it's not, not just first year, but uh, October, sell a lot of honey. <laughs> October is, is a really great time for fall fests and all sorts of fall activities. If you've got honey to sell, those are great opportunities to sell honey, to promote honey bees and honey production. Um, as far as what you do in the hive, same thing. Just just stay aware. If you put a row of treatment in the hive, you'll you'll need to be going back and either checking it, depending on what you use. If you use a row of treatment, I recommend Apigard. It's a uh, it's a good soft chemical varroa treatment, and it's not nearly as temperature sensitive as Apolife Bar, and it's not 100% effective, but it's effective enough that it will knock down enough varroa that the bees can usually handle it. They can usually handle the remainder of the problem. Um, November, December, just on warm days, make sure the bees are flying out of the hive. If you're short of feed in November and December, you're in big trouble. A candy board is about your best option at that point. And there's a, a blue million recipes for making that, that uh, sugar candy. I don't use them because uh, if my bees are too light in November and December, just tough cookies. You know, they're <laughs> those those that's cleaning up the gene pool for me. You know, I, I won't raise bees from those queens the next spring because they'll be dead. But uh, I feed in August and September to make sure that they're not light in November and December. And you roll back around to January and all of a sudden you realize that it's another year and I've got to start all this over again. And the second thing that you realize is that your honey crop for year number two was set up by what you did in year number one. Likewise, your honey crop in year number three is going to be set up by what you do in year number two. And this is what I see with beekeepers when they first start. Their first year, they're fascinated by honeybees. And you probably won't ever lose that fascination. But they're fascinated by honeybees, and they take really good care of them. They pester them, and they, you know, they take really great care of their honeybees. But they don't make much honey. But they're not really expecting to. They just love the bees. The second year, they make a pretty good crop of honey. And they think, man, I have got this whipped. There ain't nothing to this beekeeping. And the third year they call wanting more bees because their bees died. <laughs> and the reason for that is because in the excitement and exuberance of making a good honey crop the second year, they forgot to prepare for the third year. They didn't get their bees set up. They went into the fall light in food stores, heavy in mite count. They were too caught up in making this monster honey crop and they forgot to set themselves up for the next year. So what happens this year is a direct result of what we did last year. Likewise, what happens next year will be a direct result of how we take care of them this year. So it never stops. The only time it stops is when you get so frustrated you say to heck with it. <laughs> and I've never been that frustrated yet. I don't have no idea what time it is. So, the time. Well, let's go. If anybody's got a question, I'll be glad to answer any question you got. I can lie to you as well out there as I can in here. So.